please join me for a moment of preparation to preach. <clears throat> God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Our rock and our redeemer. So when I was little, my dad used to decide that it was time to pray together as a family when we were in a jam, like in the moment of crisis, which is a good idea. And it actually always seemed to work the times that I remember him doing it. Particularly, I remember once that we were at Meyer and came out of the store and, and the car wasn't working. So we're sitting, it's late at night, and we're sitting in the car and he was trying to figure out what to do. I don't know why it was, it was such a crisis because, I, I don't know, I mean, it was before the time of cell phones, maybe that was part of it, maybe he didn't have AAA, um, but he seemed to be at a loss. And I remember him saying, okay kids, well, let's pray together. And we did, and after a few minutes, someone came along and ended up helping us get the car running. I was little, so I don't remember really exactly how it happened, but I just remember thinking, wow, that worked. <laughs> my dad would always say, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am with them, quoting Matthew 18, of course. And I was amazed how reliable this formula proved when we prayed with my dad. <clears throat> But I was also frustrated that when I prayed by myself sometimes, maybe praying to get my own horse, <laughs> or praying that my dad would be happy after the divorce. It didn't always happen, what I prayed for. Later, of course, life has taught me that even when two or three or lots of people are all gathered together and praying for the same thing, that doesn't always mean that we get what we want. But we still want to believe in prayer. When we hear of another mass shooting, another hurricane raising almost an entire island, another diagnosis of stage four cancer. We say, I'm praying. We send thoughts and prayers. Now, have you ever said you're sending thoughts and prayers and not done much about it? Or prayed for a second, prayed real quick, and then kind of just moved on? I have. I'll be the first to admit that I have not always been perfect about follow through on that. I think partly it's because it's discouraging. Because as much as we pray, we might not stop the next mass shooting, the next hurricane. We might not make the cancer go away. What is the purpose of prayer? Is it just to feel more peaceful, more grateful, or to remind us that we need to have faith? Does it do anything beyond that? Why is it so important to pray regularly? Aren't there better ways that we could be spending our time? When we become members of the church, we vow to support it with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. This is stewardship. This is what our series is about right now. Um, as we move through this, this fall stewardship series, it's about caring for and carrying forward 
Christ's church. Prayer is always listed first on that list. I've actually seen some of the other ones shift around, but I think I've always seen prayer listed first. And it's interesting because it seems the most trifling and actually kind of the easiest out of all the tasks that we're called to do as members of the body of Christ. But persisting in prayer is not easy work. And it is much more powerful work than most people give it credit for. In his book on stewardship, Committed to Christ, Bob Crossman writes, to grow toward a deeply devoted prayer life, one must pray. That's all. Fancy that. You have to pray to grow in your prayer life. It doesn't just like happen like a lightning bolt in some moment for the select chosen people to become good at praying all the time. No, you actually just have to do it and do it and figure it out. Jesus urges his disciples to pray throughout the Gospels. It's a, it's a common theme. Even when he's on the brink of arrest and death, he doesn't tell them to do something that we would think of as more useful. He just keeps begging them to stay awake and pray. In our Gospel reading today, Jesus tells a story to illuminate, as Luke says, the need to pray continuously and not be discouraged. It's a story about a city where an unjust judge lives. A powerful man who does not use his power to do much good. In the same city is a widow. A powerless woman who holds on to her dignity with such determination that it ends up giving her power in unexpected ways. The judge didn't care what God thought, nor did he care about people. But this woman keeps coming to him and demanding that he give her justice against her adversary. Now this was probably one of her own male family members that was not giving her justice. Even her family isn't for her, isn't helping her out. Where else can she turn? The judge refused. He had no reason to listen to a woman with no man to back her up. But she persisted. She kept coming back. And finally he gave in. It was not because he changed, but because she was embarrassing That part that I, that I even switched the translation as I read it to show you the variety there, it can be translated wearying him. It can even be translated so that she won't attack me. He was scared. The word literally means to keep down. All right. It means to keep down, to subdue. In the end, she wielded power over him. He was scared of her making him look bad. Then Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Won't God provide justice? When his chosen people cry out day and night, Will he be slow to help them? Okay, so we just have to pray to God a lot, like a lot more. But wait, really? Is God only a little bit better than an unjust judge? Like we just have to be annoyingly persistent and then we'll get what we want? That doesn't sound right either. Actually, the way that I understand this story 
is that the judge is not a model for God or a comparison to God at all. The judge is where God is most absent in the story. There are a lot of unjust judges in the world. A lot of people who do not care what God wants, nor care about other human beings. In response to such despairing situations, we have to be like the widow. We have to be like the widow in our life of prayer, turning tirelessly to God, persistent in believing that the true power of the universe is on our side when we are powerless. And when we walk with the powerless, the victims of violence and discrimination, the people who have lost their homes, with those who battle fatal diseases, God is working to leverage our weakness against the unjust and cruel powers of this world to embarrass them, to show them for what they really are. Now I hear differently Jesus' words from Matthew 18 that say, Truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three of you are gathered in my name, I am among them. It's not about getting whatever we want. It's about coming together in one spirit for God's will to be done. Longing for that will to be done. And finding that God is present. That's the key, the crux of this promise. I am there among them. God is with us, bearing with us in our longing. What this story is telling us is that prayer shapes us for persistence. In a world full of injustice and suffering, where a resolution is almost always slow to come, it deepens our faith that God can change and is changing the world. We pray for all people, as 2 Timothy instructs us to do. All people. And so we begin to expect and to facilitate the spirits moving in all people. We pray even for the kings and the authorities. Even for the ones who make the rules for their own benefit. And care not about God's will nor take care of others. A special command to pray for these rulers is needed precisely because in that time they didn't want to, in this time we often don't want to. It seems that some of them are beyond redeeming. But God can work grace and work out purposes even through them. At the same time, the purpose of prayer is not just to do things inside of us. If that was all it did, we might as well just go to therapy or listen to some self-help podcasts. Prayer also opens us to the moving of a mysterious grace. It beckons it in. It's a grace that is beyond our consciousness, beyond our control, that does something. This grace quickens us and empowers us to act according
according to God's will, according to God's plan. And then, since we are part of an interconnected web of life, connected to everything else that exists in creation, that opening up to grace in us allows for a space, for a little more space, to open up to that grace in the world. It spreads out from us, it ripples, and it has inexplicable effects. This story is also the end of a long answer to a question about when the kingdom of God will come. That was what sparked this discourse of Jesus in this part of the gospel. The Pharisees asked him, when will the kingdom of God come? We can assume then that the parable is meant to address why the world is so far off right now from where the kingdom of God would have it be. When at the same time, Jesus began his answer by saying, the kingdom of God is within you. So it's here, and it's also so far off. In prayer, we learn to live in a tension between two worlds. The exhausting, brutal world full of unjust judges, disaster, and disease, and an inner world of communion with God that is growing within us and flowing out of us to begin permeating this web of life and bringing it closer to God's kingdom. If we are persistent in prayer, we experience God's presence even in the long suffering of injustice. We begin to perceive and to trust how God is creating justice, even now. We might see, as I did, that though it took many painful years, our father finally did find happiness after the divorce. We might see that though the cancer was not cured, healing did come through peace and joy. In life. We might see that though the trauma of a violent attack will never be erased, the young survivors are demanding a safer world and finding courage and hope together. But when the human one comes, will he find faithfulness on earth? That's the question that Jesus poses at the end of his long answer. The Pharisees asked, when will the kingdom come? And Jesus asks, will the human one find faithfulness when he comes? That's why I keep talking about justice. You might have been thinking, well, that's not all we pray for, right? I mean, more often even, we pray for health or, or for abundance or for love, for better relationships. But I use this word because that is what the widow is seeking in the story that Jesus told about why prayer is so important. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Justice is, in essence, the righting of a wrong. Before it was ever synonymous with legal systems or a favorite word for liberal agendas, it was about what God does to justify what is out of line, to correct what is doing harm. All prayer that is faithful is for seeking justice. It reshapes the way you live. It makes you an instrument of justice, of bringing the world closer to how God intends it. You pray so you can become an answer to your own prayers. I got that phrase, becoming an answer to your own prayers, from 
A book called Common Prayer, A Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals. This past year I used it to guide my prayer time every day. And if I skip a day, I miss it. I miss its forceful, poetic words of worship, of encouragement, of inspiration. Now that book may or may not be what would motivate you to pray every day. But look for something. A book or an app or a devotional guide or, or whatever method or, or thing that makes you feel like you've missed talking to a dear friend when you don't do it. Talking to a dear friend is exactly how prayer should feel. It's not about special words that you use or getting into a special posture or a position. Do whatever helps you feel that you're having a relationship. Fully present and delighted to be here now with your God. Trust that this relationship will propel you forward to start finding and becoming the justice that you're looking for. Prayer is refusing to give up on the hope that what is wrong in the world can be made right. Prayer is revolutionary. That's what this story is about. It's about bringing the revolution of God's kingdom. Will Christ find faithful people on this earth that help that justice along, that help be an answer to these prayers that we've been praying all along? <coughs> Prayer is inviting God to come alive in us and be powerful in us right now. So why don't we pray? Spirit of Christ, may you make us all as persistent in prayer as that courageous and faithful will. Help us not to rest in discouragement nor in ease until you bring justice wherever wrongs must be righted. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to rise now in body or in spirit as we join in our closing hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer, number 496.